Okay, so let's begin paper two, which is a multiple choice extended option for biology. Uh, IGCSE from Cambridge International Examination, CIE, and this is May, June 2018, and the code is 0610-21. All right, let's get started. Let's go! Let's go! Question one. Which organisms carry out respiration, growth, movement, and excretion? Okay, so the saying that I use, uh, there are different ones out there, is Mrs. Nerg. Don't know why, it just seems to work. So we have an M, movement, respiration, and there's another R here down, down here, reproduction. Either order, doesn't matter. Sensitivity, nutrition, excretion, and growth. And these are the characteristics that all living things possess. So, plants are not all living things. Arthropods and flowering plants, there's other living things in those. Animals only, nope, it is all living things. Okay, so the answer is A. Question two, the diagram shows an animal whose scientific name is Falco peregrinus. Okay, to which species does it belong? So is it a bird or is it F uh, peregrinus? Is it Falco or is it a vertebrate? It is all of those things. What is a species? What is a species? Okay, bird, no, that's not specific enough. Falco, that is the genus. It's a vertebrate, but that's not specific enough. F. Peregrinus. So King Philip came over for great soup. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So Falco is genus and Peregrinus is species. Okay, so F. Peregrinus is species. Question three, what kind of skin do amphibians have? Okay, so amphibians are things like frogs. So are, do frogs have dry without scales? Nope, they need to be moist. Okay, so they need to be moist. Now, do they have scales or do they not have scales? They, frogs, do not have scales. So they're moist without scales. There we go. Question four, the diagram shows a flowering plant. Okay, so it's a plant with flowers. Use the key to identify the plant. Okay, so it is a plant. Yes, we know that. Does it have four? Does the flower have four petals or does the flower have five petals? Okay, so we can't really see the top one very well because it doesn't all fit on the screen, but we have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we are on this branch. Okay, are the leaves smooth edges or do they have jagged edges? These are the leaves here and they look jagged to me. So that means the answer is D. There we go. Question five. In which part of the cell does aerobic respiration occur? Is it the cytoplasm, the mitochondrion, the ribosomes, or the vesicles? Okay, ribosomes are for making proteins. So it's not that. Vesicles, well, they're for transportation. That's not aerobic respiration. Well, cytoplasm, well, it is in the cytoplasm because every all the other things are in the cytoplasm, but it's the mitochondria are in the cytoplasm, but that's not specific enough. So it's in specifically in the mitochondria that aerobic respiration takes place with all the proteins on the folded membranes inside the mitochondria. Okay, six, question six. Why do some root cells have root hairs? Is it A, for the maintenance of temperature of the cell sap? I can't see how the root hairs would have to do with temperature. Is it B, to increase the surface area of the cells? Well, yes, it definitely is because the root hairs just basically make a root like that into a root like this. Well, all those are obviously attached to the main root. Yeah, that would be a terrible biological drawing. You'd lose many marks if this was a paper five or six where you did that. But basically, you can absorb through all of these little tiny surfaces. Is it to increase the volume of the cell sap? That makes no difference to anything really. Is it to provide a place for the cell nuclei? Uh, nope, no reason for that. So the answer is B. 
Question seven, which words correctly complete the paragraph? So diffusion may be defined as a net movement of particles from a region of their something concentration to the region of their something com concentration where movement is something, a concentration gradient. Okay, so is it from a re is diffusion, we're talking about diffusion here, from a, a region of their high or low? Well, it goes from high concentration to low concentration. It says from high, fr from to. And this is diffusion, it's passive. There's no energy in, so it has to be from high to low. And is this up a concentration gradient or down a concentration gradient? Gradient. You can sometimes say with or against. Okay, this is down a concentration gradient. All right, that's just the terms that we use. It's down a concentration gradient from high to low. Question eight, which part of a plant root hair is partially permeable? Okay, so the partially, partially permeable is basically the mem it has to be a membrane because that's what things have to cross. Cell sap, there that's completely it's you just have diffusion across the sap. There's nothing there is nothing to stop things from going past. So it's not partially permeable, it's completely permeable. Cell surface membrane, yes. The cell vacuole. Now the vacuole is surrounded by a membrane, but this is a root hair. And root hairs don't really need much of a vacuole. They're really small, so they don't really have much of a vacuole to worry about the permeability. That's the main cells have the vacuoles. And the cell wall, no, that's completely permeable. Okay. The cell wall is much more like a mesh. Question nine, the table shows the results of food tests carried out on a fruit. So we have the test, we have Benedict's and it's positive. Well, Benedict's is a test for reducing sugar. Okay, glucose and other similar sugars. Burette, that's a test for protein. Ethanol, that's a test for fats or lipids or oils. And iodine, that's a test for starch. So what did the fruit contain? If it's positive for these two, that means it's positive for reducing sugar and protein. And that would be option C. There we go. Question 10. An experiment was carried out to investigate the effect of pH on enzyme action. The graph shows the results. Okay, we have the x-axis and the y-axis. What are the labels for the, the x-axis and the y-axis? Okay, so the key with, with this is to investigate the effect of pH on enzyme action. So they are changing the pH and they are measuring the enzyme action, which means the thing that's being changed or the independent variable is always on the x-axis and then the thing you're measuring is always on the y-axis. So what are they changing? They are changing, not the time, they're changing the pH. Okay, now are they measuring the time or the rate of reaction? Well, the rate of reaction may be the time for something to happen, but there be, to be more specific at this point, it's just the rate of reaction. They're not saying the time it takes for the color to change from this to that. What they're saying is they're just measuring the effect. So they, it's just the rate of the reaction in whatever manner they, they choose to use to measure the rate. It might be time, it might be bubbles, it might be something else. Could be anything. Question 11, the equation for photosynthesis is shown. All right, photosynthesis is the opposite of aerobic respiration. In aerobic respiration, you use oxygen and you produce carbon dioxide. So it's the opposite of that. So you use carbon dioxide and you produce oxygen. Okay, now two, is that light or is that water? Well, light is essential for photosynthesis, but it's not a, a reactant. It's not something that reacts. It just gives the energy for the reaction to happen. So it has to be with water. So the answer is B. Question 12, what is the best source of vitamin C in a balanced diet? Of these options, is it fish, 
Is it fruit? Is it meat? Or is it rice? It's not saying that there's absolutely no vitamin C in any of these other things, although I don't think there is, but I could be wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The best source that they want to know is fruit, especially things like citrus fruits, oranges, grapefruits, those sorts of things. Question 13. A young active woman requires more of which constituent in her diet than a young active man? Does she need more fat, more iron, more protein, or more vitamin C? Well, a young active woman needs more iron than a young active man because a woman menstruates, which means she loses a large amount of blood every month with a whole bunch of iron in. And a man doesn't do that. So it's B. And question 14, which condition could be caused by a lack of iron? Okay, so anemia, well, yes, it's anemia, can be caused by a lack of iron. Cholera, that's a bacterial thing. Scurvy, you don't have enough vitamin C. Diabetes, that's too much sugar. Well, that's your insulin isn't necessarily responding. Okay, it's to do with sugar. Question 15, the diagram shows part of a section through a plant stem. Which tissue transports water from the roots to the leaves? Okay, transports water. We're talking about which, which tissue is the xylem. All right, so is it the very outside? No. The very inside? No. And now we have our vascular bundle. Is it the outside of the vascular bundle or the inside? It is the inside. All right, quest, answer is C. Question 16. Petroleum jelly is waterproof and transparent. Covering the underside of the leaves of a plant with a thin layer of petroleum jelly will slow down the rate of water loss from the plant. Which statement explains this? Is it because the plant absorbs nutrients from the petroleum jelly? Uh, no, there's not really any nutrients from the petroleum jelly. No. Plants absorb water from the petroleum jelly. No, it's waterproof, which means water doesn't, uh, doesn't mix with it. It doesn't have water in it. Stomata are blocked by the petroleum jelly. That is definitely the answer because stomata are holes and that's not, it's, it's the, nothing can get in and out if, if they're blocked. And petro petroleum jelly stops photosynthesis. First of all, it's on the underside of the leaf and the light comes from the top. Second of all, it's transparent. So it's not going to stop any photosynthesis other than it's blocking the stomata, which means it's not going to be able to get in any carbon dioxide. And... Yeah, and the water won't be able to, you won't have transpiration, so you won't be able to pull the, the water up from the, the roots. Question 17. A student places two samples of crushed apple into two beakers, P and Q. The samples are of equal size. She adds five centimeters cubed of pectinase solution to beaker P and five centimeters cubed of water to beaker Q. Okay, so pectinase. Okay, the key, word, key parts of that word are ACE, means it's an enzyme, and pectin, means it break, breaks down pectin, which is thick stuff in the juice, really, what makes it uh, pulpy. Okay, well, not completely, not the pulp, it, it makes it thicker. After five minutes, she places the samples of crushed apple into two different filter funnels and measures the volume of juice filtering through from each sample over a period of 10 minutes. Which graph shows her results? So pectin, as I said, is, makes it thicker. So if, it, if the, the one with the enzyme will make it thinner than it would be without the enzyme. If it's thinner, then it will go through the beaker through the filter much more easily. Okay, so that means beaker, so P was with the enzyme and Q was with water. So P is thinner than Q. Now, if we look at these graphs, this is it, the y-axis is saying total volume of juice filtered through, which means they will all start low and end high. You don't, as you filter things through, you don't get less at the end. So you have your filter, you have your conical flask here, you have your filter going down here. And as it drips down over time, you'll start off with a little bit, then you'll get more, 
and it's a total volume. It's not the amount per minute. So this one makes no sense because the volume would be reduced. It would be evaporating off somehow. Okay, so that's not it. Again, with this one, it would start with a large volume in the flask and end off with very little. So it would be going upwards. And that would, that's silly. It doesn't, that doesn't happen. Okay, so is it A? Is it a straight line? Well, no, because at, um, if, you've, if you've done filtering in your class, you'll notice that at the beginning, when there's a lot of stuff in your filter, in your funnel, it will, it will filter out faster than at the very end, when there's very, very little there, it'll filter out much more slowly. So it's not going to be a straight line. And also, P has the enzyme, so it should filter faster than Q. Okay, so A doesn't make sense, but B does. The one with the enzyme, you can filter out more of the juice because it's not as thick and it will filter out a lot, filter out quickly at the start, and then the filtering slows down as there gets less and less liquid into the funnel. Okay, so B is the answer. There we go. Question 18. During the process of blood clotting, damage to blood vessels stimulates L and M is converted to N. What are L, M, and N? Okay, so if you get, if you get a cut, the very first thing that happens is platelets come and try and do the best they can to block up the, the wound. They won't be able to do it for long though because they need uh, a mesh to form over top of it and to help trap in everything that they, that they can to seal it up. Okay, so is fibrin, does, that, does fibrin turn into fibrinogen or does fibrinogen turn into fibrin? Well, the answer is D. Fibrinogen turns into fibrin and fibrin is a mesh that closes the wound. Question 19. A child is vaccinated against measles. After a period of time, the child is infected with the measles virus. The graph shows the concentration of measles antibodies in the child's bloodstream during this time. Okay, so this is probably when they were vaccinated. So they have some antibodies in their blood and then the most of the antibodies disappear, but there are still some there. But then this is this would be where, where they'd be infected. And as soon as they're infected with the measles virus, the body jumps into the act action and produces tons and tons and tons of antibodies and hopefully destroys the virus. And then the number of, of antibodies can disappear well, slowly. And there'll still be a little bit left at the end, just like there was here. Okay, so which statement is consistent with the information in the graph? After the vaccination, the child produced memory cells. Well, that works. The memory cells are just remain in the blood for quite a long time. Different, mem different memory cells can remain in for different amounts of time, for years often. And they're ready for the infection. They're waiting for, to be inf for an infection to happen. B, the child has passive immunity against measles. Well, passive immunity means that basically they're not doing it themselves. They're getting it either from their mother or something like that. So no, it's not passive immunity, it's active immunity. The measles virus contains antibodies. No, the measles does not contain antibodies. The measles body virus contains antigens that the antibodies can then identify. The antigens are bad, the antibodies are good. The antibodies are from your body. The vaccination failed to protect the child against measles. Doesn't look like it. it, it they were infected. Lots of antibodies were, were produced when they, when they were infected. And then they started to drop down again once the infection wasn't a problem anymore. So it looks like the answer here is A. Question 20. Muscles are responsible for the ventilation of the lungs during breathing. Which row describes their actions during the inspiration of air? Okay, there's a couple words they could use for this. For some reason, CIE always chooses inspiration for when you're inhaling and expiration for exhaling. I always find this quite irritating or frustrating because inspiration means you have a great idea or it can mean inhaling, breathing in. 
and expiration if you if you have past the expiration date on your your yogurt it has gone off so expiration is often death <laughs> or it's exhaling okay so that's what they those are the terms that they always use even though inhaling and exhaling works just as well anyway um which row describes their action during the inspiration of air do the diaphragm muscles, so they're breathing in. Do the diaphragm muscles contract or do, do they relax? Well, the diaphragm muscles contract. All right, so you have your, your lungs. I'm just going to draw it simply. When it's relaxed, the lungs are like this. When you're breathing in, that's the lungs, the, the, the pleural cavity. The diaphragm, this is the diaphragm it contracts so it's it's shorter and that means that this volume here is bigger so it contracts the and then you have the external intercostal muscles and the internal intercostal muscles okay so the internal intercostal muscles are really good for basically what they do is they bring the rib rib cage in and that's really good when you cough when you cough the internal intercostal muscles contract and make it so that the volume up here gets even smaller. But when you inhale, the external inter intercostal muscles contract and bring the volume of air out. So it is that they contract, the external intercostal muscles contract and the internal intercostal muscles relax. The internal intercostal muscles are really good for coughing. Question 21. Yeast is able to respire both aerobically and anaerobically. Which statement describes the waste products of yeast respiration? So aerobic respiration produces alcohol, alcohol as one of its waste products. No. No, that's not produced as one of its waste, waste, waste products. Aerobic respiration produces three times as much carbon dioxide as anaerobic respiration from one molecule of glucose. That is actually true. That is the answer. And anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration both produce the same amount of carbon dioxide from one molecule of glucose. No, no. And anaerobic respiration, respiration produces three times as much carbon dioxide as aerobic respiration from one molecule of glucose. No. So the answer is B. And just to go over this for our anaerobic respiration in muscles, our formula for this is C6H12O6 produces 2C3H6O3, and that's lactic acid. And then that can, converts back into carbon dioxide and water when there's, when, when there's oxygen available. And in yeast, anaerobic respiration starts off again with C6H12O6 uh, glucose. And it converts into 2C2H5OH plus 2CO2. Okay, so the C2H5OH, that's ethanol. And if you remember aerobic respiration, so these are both anaerobic. Aerobic respiration starts off with C6H12O6 plus 6O2 produces 6CO2 plus 6H2O. And so 6CO2 is three times as much as 2CO2. There we go. Question 22. The table shows the presence or absence of chemicals in solution in different parts of a healthy kidney. Which row is correct? Okay, so we have glucose, protein, salts, and urea. Okay, as it says here, they all are in the blood plasma in the glomerulus. That makes that bit easy. So it's just these two rows. Now the fluid entering the kidney tubule, what is filtered out first? The glucose that is filtered out into the kidney tubule that does go in. So this is wrong. Okay. The proteins, proteins are too big to filter out. So that does not get filtered out. Salts that does get filtered out because they're they're water soluble. They they just are, they just they're soluble. They they filter out easily. Urea that gets filtered out. So it looks like the answer is D. Let's just double check though. In the ureter, what gets put back in? 
and what stays. So the protein didn't get filtered out in the first place into the kidney tubule. It stays not in, it's not in the ureter, ureter. So that is correct. Now glucose, that it depends. You shouldn't really have glucose in your, in your ureter, but if you have diabetes, it, it, it can, it would be in your, in your ureter. So that it depends, but generally, no, it shouldn't be in your ureter. So that should be okay. Salts, well, no, some salts get put back in, some salts stay back out. Okay, so some of those, that's a sum. It depends on your concentration of salts. So that's kind of wrong, sort of wrong. Some of them go back into your blood, some of them stay, uh, get filtered out. And your urea, yes, urea is one of the big parts of urine. So that's correct. All right, so the answer is D. Question 23. Four processes occur when impulses cross a synapse. We're talking about nerves here. We have the neurotransmitter diffuses across the gap. The neurotransmitter binds with receptors. The impulse stimulates vesicles and re then re there's a release of a neurotransmitter. What is the correct sequence for these processes? Okay, so the first thing that happens is an impulse stimulates the vesicles. Okay, and once the vesicles are stimulated, they release the neurotransmitter because inside the vesicles are neurotransmitters. And then the neurotransmitters go towards the synapse and they diffuse across the gap. And once they're on the other side of the gap, they bind with the receptors. So the correct sequence is R, S, P, and Q. And that would be R, S, P, and Q, that's C. Question 24, which hormone is involved in the conversion of glucose to glycogen? Okay, glucose to glycogen, that would be insulin. Adrenaline, that's fight or flight. Estrogen is a female hormone. Testosterone is a male hormone. Insulin, it converts glucose into glycogen. There we go. Question 25, the, di the diagram shows the structure of human skin. Okay, so we have some structures here. We have Y, and that is a muscle that erects this hair. So this is a hair. It's one of your little hairs on, on, uh, that are on your skin. And this muscle, this is called the hair erector muscle that makes the, your hairs stand on end when you're chilly or something's creepy. Okay, then we have X, this one here, that is, that secretes uh, sweat out of your pores. Okay, and Z, you have little bits at the end here spread across the surface, and those uh, are those are parts of the nerve. Those help uh, sense uh, stimulus. So what are X, Y, and Z? So X, as we said here, is it a receptor? No. Is it a sensory neuron? No. It is a sweat gland. All right, why is it sensory neuron? No, it is a hair erector muscle. It's not a receptor either. And Z, it is a sensory neuron. It helps with sensing if it, you need to sweat or raise your, your hairs on, on your skin. So C, the answer is C. Question 26, a seedling was placed in a horizontal position. Which diagram shows the result of, gravitrop of the gravitropic response in the seedling? Okay, so the roots go down and the shoots go up. The answer is C. So the roots go down, shoots go up. Okay, it'd be kind of silly if the, roots, uh, if the shoots went down, but kind of silly if the roots went up, and it'd be kind of silly if they just went sideways. All right. Question 27, which hormone may be used to improve sporting performance? Well, I haven't really heard of many people injecting the hormones that cause ovulation, FSH and LH, LH follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. That would not, I don't see how that can improve sporting performance. Estrogen, again, I can't see how that would improve sporting performance, but testosterone, yes, that is absolutely something that can improve sporting performance. Question 28. Specific grape varieties are maintained using stem cuttings from mature plants that are then planted and cultivated to produce grapes. This is an example of artificial selection reproduction. 
what is the disadvantage of using asexual reproduction to produce fruit? Okay, so asexual reproduction, is it because an outbreak of disease will affect the whole crop in the same way? Well, yes, asexual reproduce, re reproduction produces clones. So the answer is A, but just to go over the other ones, just to make sure. Genetically identical fruit is produced relatively quickly. Yes, it is, but I don't see how that's a disadvantage. If you want a whole crop of strawberries, you want to be able to produce them very quickly because the season is short. Uh, no pollination or pollinators are required. Again, that's also true, but that's not a disadvantage because you don't need the pollinators to find the plants. And the characteristics of the grapes will vary between plants. Well, this is asexual reprodu reproduction, so they won't vary. They're clones. All right. Question 29. Which two statements are correct for the process of cross-pollination in plants? So cross-pollination, that is sexual reproduction in plants. And sexual reproduction produces variation. So does cross-pollination increase potential for variation in the offspring? Yes, it does, because you do not produce genetically identical offspring. Pollen is transferred to a different flower on the same plant. No, no, it's not on the same plant. And because it's cross-pollination means it's on onto a different plant. Reduces potential to respond to environmental change. No, that would be for asexual reproduction. So because the more variation you have, the more the plant can respond to, to environmental change. And pollen is transferred to a flower on a different plant of the same species? Yes. So the answer here is one and four. So B. There we go. Question 30. What is the function of the mitochondria in a sperm cell? Well, sperm cells have lots and lots and lots of mitochondria. Mitochondria produces energy and they have a long way to go. They, they need the energy to fuel their, their flagellum so they can go a long way and quickly. So is it so that they can penetrate the surface of the egg cell? No, that's for the enzymes at the head of the, the sperm cell. Is it to propel the sperm towards the egg? No, that's the flagellum. It's to give the energy to, to, to propel the sperm towards the egg. Is it to store food energy? No, it's not a storage structure. And does it supply the energy for movement? Absolutely, that is what it does. Question 31. The diagram shows the chromosomes in the nucleus of a body cell in an adult fruit fly. So the body cell means that it is not the sperm or the egg. What are the diploid and haploid numbers of the chromosome in the fruit cell? So if we look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that means the diploid number is eight, because this is a diploid cell. The haploid number is half the number of chromosomes as a diploid number, which means the answer is B. There we go. Question 32. The diagram shows the phenotypes for blood groups in a family. All right. Which statement about the genotypes of the parents is correct? So when we're talking about the genotypes of blood groups, we're talking about three different options. We have IA, we have IB, and we have IO. IO is recessive, and IA and IB are both dominant. So we can have IA, IA, and IA, IO, those are both type A. We can have IB, IB, and IB and IO, and those are both type B. And we can have IO and IO, and that is type O. Those are the three options. So which statement about the genotypes of the parents is correct? Both parents have alleles for blood group A and B. All right, let's see that. Well, we have to have an O in there as well. Okay, which means, the, sorry, there's one more option. We can have IA and IB, and that is type AB. So they don't have, they bo don't both have A and B, or else they would be AB. So that is not correct. Both parents have the alleles for blood group O. Well, if they produced an offspring, that is IO, IO, one of these IOs had to go from the mother, or I'm just saying that's the mother, that could be the father, 
and one of them had to go from the other other parent okay so they yes they had to each have a an allele for blood group o only the father has the allele for blood group o no they need to needs to have one from each and only the mother has the allele for blood group o it has to be only the allele from each okay there we go Question 33. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder which results in severe illness in homozygous individuals. In some human populations, being heterozygous, heterozygous can be beneficial. What could be the reason for this? So heterozygous individuals are not affected by the disorder. Yes, they're not affected by the disorder, but they are still carriers of the, the recessive allele, which means they can pass it on to their offspring. So that's not necessarily a benefit. Heterozygous individuals are more resistant to malaria. That is definitely the answer. That's, that's the reason you can be beneficial. And that's why it says in some human populations, because not all, all areas of the world are, have malaria as a problem. If there's no malaria in, in the area, then being homozygous for sickle cell anemia is very not beneficial. It's very detrimental. So it is caused by a dominant allele? No, it's caused by a recessive allele. And the order is sex linked? No, that is not a benefit. B. The answer is B. Question 34. Which statement describes the relationship between evolution and natural selection? Is it A, a change in the adaptive features of a population over time causes evolution resulting in natural selection? Well, really, that's not the answer because evolution is the end product when you've had natural selection because of a change in adaptive features. So it's just kind of mixed up. B. Evolution causes a change in the adaptive features of a population over time, resulting in natural selection. Again, the change in the adaptive features is what results in evolution. Is it C, evolution causes natural selection? Again, we could stop there because evolution does not cause natural selection. Natural selection causes evolution. Or is it D, evolution is a change in the adaptive features of a population over time as a result of natural selection? Yes, that is pretty much the definition of evolution. So the answer is D. There we go. Question 35. The diagram shows a food chain. So we have maize or corn and that's eaten by locusts and that and the locusts are eaten by lizards and the lizards are eaten by, eaten by snakes. And it says how many kilojoules are in each level? What is the efficiency of the energy transfer between the maize and the lizards in this food chain? So between the maize and the lizards. So we have between so 100 kilojoules at the end divided by 10,000 kilojoules at the beginning times 100, to make it into a percent, equals 1%. So the answer is C. Question 36. The diagram shows part of a food web from a rainforest. In this food web, at which trophic level are the anacondas? Okay, so we're talking about different trophic levels. So the fruits and leaves, these are producers. And everything that eats a producer, which is the iguanas, howler monkeys, those are primary consumers. And everything that eats the primary consumers, those are secondary con consumers. And the things that eat the secondary consumers are the tertiary consumers. It's handy in this one that they did them a nice neat rose. They don't always do that though. Okay, so which one, what are we looking for? We're looking for the anacondas and the anacondas are in the secondary consumer level. So the answer is B. Question 37. The diagram shows the structure of a bacterial cell. The presence of structure X in the bacterial cell is one reason why bacteria are used in genetic engineering. What is structure X? That is a ring, a small circle of DNA called the plasmid. They, bacteria do not have endoplasmic reticulum. They do not have any mitochondria. And they have, well, they do have ribosomes, but the ribosomes are smaller than 
in animal cells, but rib ribosomes are used to make the proteins. But the reason why they use bacteria for genetic engineering is because of the plasmids. It's very easy to insert, to cut and to insert the DNA into it. Question 38. What does penicillium need to grow in a fermenter? So penicillium, that is a fungus. And a fungus needs specific things. It needs amino acids to make proteins. It needs carbohydrates for energy and it needs oxygen to do aerobic respiration. So that means the answer is A. Question 39. Deforestation can have a negative impact on the environment. Which statement about the negative impact of deforestation is correct? Is it that it decreases the levels of carbon dioxide, which can lead to reduced rate of photosynthesis? Deforestation increases the levels of carbon dioxide because the photosynthesis removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Is it that it decreases the amount of water flowing in local rivers so there is less flooding? No, deforestation actually increases the amount of water flowing in local ri ri rivers and that could cause increased flooding. And the, re the reason why it can increase the water flowing is because it's not sucking the water up to the leaves and, and, and using it and you doing transpiration. Is it that it leads to soil loss so there, it, so there is less fertile soil for the growth of crops in the area? Yes. When you remove the forests, there's not much holding the soil in place. So the, the nice fertile soil will, can be blown away much more easily or washed away. And the and D, does it, is it that it provides less land for the extraction of natural resources? Well, actually, when you remove a forest, that's one of the reasons why they remove forests is so that they can have more land for the extra, extraction of natural, natural resources. So the answer is C. Question 40. When nitrates enter a lake, they cause rapid growth of algae on the surface of the water. This causes the following changes in the lake. Okay, so this is the process of eutrophication. Okay, so the, the nitrates are washed off from the fields, they enter the lake, and the algae on the very surface of the water uh, starts to grow very rapidly. What that means is it blocks out all the light on the very surface of the water so that any of the plants underneath will die because they don't have any light to be able to do photosynthesis. So that means the producers and die, and when they die, they settle to the bottom of the lake and decomposition increases. Okay, now decomposition, that's done by decomposers, which are things like bacteria and fungi and things like that. So they generally do aerobic respiration. And the reason why they can do a lot of aerobic respiration is because the algae that's on the surface are doing photosynthesis and producing oxygen and decomposers grow very quickly as well so they can use up a lot of oxygen okay so inside the lake what that means is that the oxygen that was produced by the, the algae is being used up so that means there's a decrease in the concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water and if you don't have the dissolved oxygen in the water fish and other aquatic animals will die and then the lake just becomes quite dead and it becomes smelly and it becomes ugly and eutrophication is not something you want. So the answer is four, three, one, two. And let's see, that is D. So the answer to this question is D. And that is the end of this exam. I hope you have found this useful. I hope it will help you in your exam. And if you did like it, please press the thumbs up button and we'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. If you have anything you'd like to say to us, any comments, we'd really like to, to hear from you. Just write them in the discussion section below and have a great day.